Our final speaker here today is going to talk about innovative collaboration and creating value, which obviously are significant themes to uh, our organization. David Nash, who is the founding dean of the Jefferson School of Population Health on the campus of Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and the Dr. Raymond C. and Doris N. Grandin Professor of Health Policy. Uh, Dr. Nash is a board certified internist and actually has been to Grand Rapids on multiple occasions. Uh, he is the founder of the original Office of Health Policy in 1990. The office evolved into one of the first departments of health policy in an American medical college. And in 2008, the Jefferson School of Population Health was created. It was the first health science university to place four master's degree programs under one roof for healthcare leaders. Dr. Nash is an internationally recognized for his work and is widely published and on several boards and again has received many healthcare awards and distinction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. David Nash. Thanks, Rick. Morning. Well, first, uh, I want to tell you a little story. So uh, almost nine months ago, Tina Fries called me, and it's true, Rick, uh, this was my fourth visit to your amazing organization. So Tina Fries calls me uh, and says, gee, you know, we'd love you to come and work with our board, and we're all worried about health reform, and you know, we've been following your work, and we know you have helped uh, John Burns and David Dull. I said, okay, great, you know, I'm looking forward to it. Nobody told me I'd be following John Stossel and Mike Abrahoff and then be the speaker right before lunch. So uh, talk about a hoodwink. That was a wonderful trick, uh, but we're going to have some fun. So how about a round of applause for a moment for Tina Fries and Pat Aitchinson, who really made this all possible? Okay. And I want to thank uh, Rick and Tim and your leaders. I read your uh, Vision 2020, and uh, that's a pretty inspiring document, so we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, I'm not handing out a free book, uh, but I do have a lot of material on the registration table right behind Mike's books. I hope you'll take a look at it. Uh, my goal is to not take a single piece of paper back with me to Philadelphia, so please help yourselves. Uh, copies of our four journals our book on hospital governance, our two textbooks on quality. Uh, so it may not be as exciting as running a ship in the Navy, but uh, it's still pretty important stuff, and I hope you'll grab all of that off of the uh, smorgasbord that we prepared for you. Uh, my topic today is, uh, as you can see, the board's role in leading the quality and safety agenda. And I, I know you have a very complex organization, multiple board members. Uh, I asked Rick, what's the total number of board members wasn't exactly sure. So, but he did tell me that the system board has fewer than a dozen people on it. So I know we have board members scattered throughout here. So uh, let me give you the punchline and then we'll work towards that together. So the punchline is um, who's ultimately responsible for the quality and safety of what you and I do every day? Well, that's a tough question. The uh, legal answer is the board, uh, not the chief of cardiology, not the chief medical officer, uh, not the chief quality officer, not Rick, but the people ultimately responsible for the outcome of what we do who bear the final fiduciary responsibility are the board members. Now, for the non-clinician board members, uh, that's a pretty scary thing. I mean, after all, they're not trained to do what we do that they bear the ultimate responsibility. They also bear the responsibility for organizing where spectrum has got to be to face what I think are the inevitable aspects of health reform, and we'll come back to that as well. So that's the main message. Let me tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to divide our time into three, possibly four parts, depending on how we're doing. So uh, part one, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tutorial, might be a review for some people. Uh, how do we get into the jam we're currently in with regard to the quality and safety agenda? And we'll talk about some vocabulary, make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, then part two, I'm going to try to give you a sense of from around the country, how are we doing in meeting the challenges that I laid out in part one? Just a quick overview. 
Uh, then part three, after I show you a picture of my family, I'm going to give you my sense of Nash's twisted vision of the future, most especially as it relates to leadership, physician leadership and board leadership. And then if we have time, I want to take uh, Rick Snyke's introduction and tell you a little bit about the country's first school of population health. That's right, not public health, population health. And after all, reading your Vision 2020, you're all about improving the health of the communities we serve, right? How exactly you're going to do that, measure that, prove that you're doing it, well, that's another issue altogether. Okay, everybody has the outline. Part one, how do we get in this jam? Part two, how are we doing? Part three, where are we going? And if we have time, hopefully part four, I'll tell you a little bit about our school. Okay, got to get the technology right. Okay, so first issue. Ah, I have no relevant conflict of interest to disclose. Thank you. Okay, so a little hard in the back of the room if you can't read the legend, but I'll wait till the front row reads it and starts to laugh. I'm waiting for that front row to read it and start to laugh. So this is a uh, tobacco smoke enema machine. This is where the expression comes from, people. I'm blowing smoke up your butt. <laughs> this is it. This is the technology of blowing smoke up your butt, with all due respect. Uh, this is from an archival collection that we have at Jefferson. So I really wanted you to see this because uh, it's a wonderful device, you know. Uh, there's no um, CPT code for this any longer, too bad. <laughs> we might be able to, uh, to use it. But I'm going to try very hard to avoid the syndrome of uh, blowing smoke up your butt. Okay, so you all know who this is. This is uh, not an internet doctored cover. This is a real live cover of the British news magazine, The Economist, with our president. Uh, this is going to hurt in ways that you and I can't even fathom. Here's the good news. We're covering a lot of people who never had insurance. We are improving access. We might even do a couple of things here and there to improve quality. It's going to be a slugfest. It's going to cost more than anybody could possibly imagine. It's going to keep guys like me in business for another decade. Wonderful. But it's going to be a huge challenge for Jefferson and for Spectrum. And we're going to come back, of course, to that theme and throughout our time together. So... Uh, for John Burns and David Dull, this is just an update. And for all of you, this is not a clinical talk. And even if there is a radiologist in the audience, I won't ask you to stand up and read this because even the non-clinicians in the room can see this is a portable x-ray. Quality is not so great. But you can see on the lateral and AP view with the beam going through the belly button, this uh, poor guy uh, has four screws holding together L5 and S1. It's also... Uh, at least four titanium lug nuts screwing these uh, screws in place. What you can't see is the titanium chicken wire and the autologous bone graft holding all this, but detail's not important. This is, of course, the post-op film from a transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, spinal fusion for you and me. And I'm uh, very happy to tell you this is uh, my x-ray from May 2002 just a little over eight years ago. So I like to show this because there's an important quality lesson in here. But the other reason I like to show this film, especially in a group this size, is uh, this x-ray elicits audience sympathy. <laughs> and when you're up here, especially following Mike, anything I can do to elicit audience sympathy, that works for me. So what's the story behind this? Well, here's a key question for all the orthopedists in the room. In 2002, how many English language peer-reviewed papers were there laying out the long-term outcome evidentiary basis for doing spinal fusion surgery? And the answer, of course, is zero. The first outcomes research paper, that is, What's the result of doing this procedure? The first outcomes research paper, the so-called sport trial, lead article in the New England Journal, came out four years after I had this surgery. So what does that mean? Well, that means at the time I was chair of the Department of Health Policy on an endowed chair 
at America's largest private medical school, and I had this operation in what I'll call for you and me a data-free environment. You get where I'm going with this? Meaning, you know, sometimes we do stuff that doesn't have such solid evidence. For me, it was three years of worsening back pain, five epidurals, and then finally a left foot drop, not a good thing. But what really prompted me to finally have this surgery, even though there was no data to support getting it done, was my physician wife, Esther. Incredibly empathetic. We've been married now 30 years, this just last month. So eight years ago was only 22 years. But she was incredibly empathetic after worsening back pain, and she finally said to me, you know, um, your key may not work in the front door if you keep complaining about this back pain. How sympathetic is that? That was the final stimulus, because I was afraid I wouldn't be